two things. It's a two-parter, all right? Uh, the first part is that I, I believe firmly in all of my experience with living creatures has uh, defined this as the fact that there are uh, two biological imperatives. And it's going to be important to keep these in mind as we look at the screen tonight because we're going to constantly return to these, these two. Um, the first biological imperative is survival of self. And so when we talk about butterfly behavior, even though it is a collective phenomenon, and we can say that uh, this and this and that, uh, sulfur does this and this and that, in a collective sense, generally speaking, it's better to think of it as an individual. This individual or that individual is exhibiting this behavior, okay? The well, survival of the individual is, is what I want to emphasize tonight. And of course, survival of the individual is its own reward. But the next, and, and weight to that, the first, is reproduction. And, and the interesting thing about uh, reproduction is that it is not necessarily of itself uh, the same rewarding. I mean, after all, if you manage to survive uh, an encounter with the predator, uh, you get away, it's like, oh, you know, there's a little adrenaline and whatever. I mean, a butterfly probably has something at least similar to adrenaline. But the point is that survival is itself the reward. In reproduction, that's not necessarily the case. And so I'm going to get into this uh, experience that maybe some of you have heard. I think last time I gave this basic butterfly biology presentation, I mentioned this. And this involves a pale tiger swallowtail uh, in a little valley outside of Indiana. Uh, I saw uh, this, this thing from a, a football field away. I mean, it's a big enough butterfly that you can actually do that. And it was coming down this riparian corridor, catching uh, little thermals off of the, it was a hot summer day, so little thermals off of the creek, and it was doing its old bent wing thing. It would, you know, maybe flap a little bit, and then it would, you know, but I could see that it was just, you know, kind of coasting. It was maybe exhibiting mating behavior, but it just didn't seem very convincing as a, as a mating behavior. Uh, and as it got closer, I began to realize this butterfly was having itself a good time. Okay, and as it went by, it, it confirmed itself to me because its legs, all six of them, were hanging down like it was in a lawn chair someplace. You know, just, it's cool. And, but this violated one of my principles because if, you know, survival is, is an important thing, then, you know, alert attention is also important. And if reproduction is important, then you should be engaging in that activity. Pure pleasure in a genetically hardwired organism like a butterfly but it seemed a little out of context, and it's, it's troubled me for a minute, and I'll get back to, to that whole thing. And the reason I want to bring that genetically hardwired thing up is that you can't imagine butterflies as being anything else. They don't have culture, they don't have you know, group related, you know, they don't really have much of a memory in terms of, of uh, you know, engineering you know, each and every day as a strategy. Like, today I'm going to go to the store, I'm going to go visit this plant, I, you know, it's just, it's all genetically hardwired, so those creatures really don't have much room for uh, fooling around. This is the title, you know, and I, I say bury there, that's a disclaimer in case you guys hold me to a higher standard. Butterflies belong to a group of organisms, a phylum arthropoda, which is the jointy legs, includes crabs, crustaceans, millipedes, you know, all of those, those kinds of things. And then they're a, in, in a class, the insecta, the insects, which, of which this is kind of a, uh, a collection. They're also a member of an order, Lepidoptera, which and you guys all know this stuff, but I, I had to go through it because I can't really act as if uh, you don't, you know, that is, if you do know it, I have to make sure. Okay, Lepidoptera comes from the, the Greek words lepidos and pteron, which are scale, wing, scaly wings. It all makes sense if anyone's had to deal with a, a butterfly one on one in the hands, you get scales, and the, their wings are is basically covered in scales. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that because that's fun stuff too. And we did the scale thing before. But uh, they're also holometabolous insects. Now, this is not, this is a hemimetabolous insect, it's a grasshopper. They get laid as an egg, they, they turn into a small grasshopper, and that small grasshopper gets bigger and bigger until it turns into an adult. Now, it's not a reproductive individual and, until it is an adult. So, all the principles of su survival and reproduction really don't apply. But holometabolous insect has four distinct stages in its development. And, uh, it's a pretty remarkable thing. Of course, you know, uh, the egg uh, to caterpillar, we just did a thing earlier tonight on the Freya fertilizer, so we kind of got the gist of what's going on there. And, and the, uh, the, the function of each of these stages is, is 
it's significant. We'll so go through some. What? Holometabolus. Holometabolus. Okay, now we're going to get into some structural yes. things before we get back to the whole cycle. We're going to cycle back and forth a little bit here. Uh, don't want to get too much into, you know, a lot of it. I don't know. I got this out from the net, and, you know, I had no idea that they had misspelled proboscis. <laughs> but I just discovered that, so this is a novelty for both of us. Uh, basic thing with the butterfly is its proboscis. It's kind of like very different from all other insects in that regard. Uh, a mosquito has a penetrating, sucking uh, mouth parts, and other insects, heteroptera, the, the, the true bugs, they have sucking mouth parts, but there's none of them that coil it up and, and have such a long one as, as Lepidoptera. And butterflies, of course, as members of, of Lepidoptera have them as well. And you know, the basic confirmation of you know, four wing, high wing, you know, straight forward. We're going to look at some of the structural acts. I, I expect you guys to memorize all of this. You know, I'm going to ask everyone what the preepistural suture number three is at the end of this presentation. All right, now, I, this is all stuff that was uh, it's available in books that, you know, you, you can get if you'd like, um, if you want to go further. But, I mean, yeah, I, people study these things. I, I learned on this particular book, this is Air Genetic, How to Know the Butterflies. And, and I took, you know, uh, butterflies apart. Um, I know that's. You know, unseemly sometimes, but I, that's how I learned. That's what I understood. And it's even cooler, as you can't see. But all of this stuff on the outside, these are sutures and there's and there's convolutions and whatnot. But on the inside, see all the muscles attached because insects have a uh, an exoskeleton. All of their muscles are on the inside. The skeleton's on the outside. Uh, and, and so it's really important that that you have muscle attachments. In order to have that, you have to have the chitinous uh, material, which is what the exoskeleton is made of. You know, kind of, you know, form knobs and/or plates that the muscles can attach to, and then the muscles move the whole skeletal structure, which move the wings and, and whatnot. So it's really pretty fascinating stuff, but it can be a little bit tough. Now, everyone um, you know knows that they have these coil probosi, and that's the basic confirmation of the head. I'm not going to get uh, too much into individual structures, just to, just to say that okay, this is there, all of these things have names, and they can be referred to if you get technical. Uh, and, and, and at every level, and this is where it, we're going to get back to that butterfly coming down the hillside. And we're going to get into a little metaphysics and a little science later on, all based on, on some of the stuff that I'm talking about right now. Now, uh, I, I, I like this image so much. It's not very good, it's fuzzy or anything, but I just kind of like because it, it was colorful. A better one, but you know, not very. Were those true colors? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm sure. Well, the blood's red, right? The mid gut green. Well, maybe not. The nervous system only seems to be yellow. I wonder what that means. Okay, the, the basic system of a butterfly has to do with about three different aspects. Okay, now, respiration, circulation of oxygen is extremely important. Now, a butterfly respiration is extremely inefficient. Uh, it's only the fact that they're so small that, it, you know, to the, the extent that the surface uh, to uh, mass ratio is, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. They're good enough. If, if it was a larger animal, there, there means the circulation. I mean, basically, there's no muscles uh, dedicated to expansion and contraction to suck air in. It's basically coming through uh, these spiracles, of which there's nine pair on the abdomen and, and, uh, and or no, no, nine pair altogether on the abdomen and the thorax. And they lead to these things called trachea. Well, trachea is essentially just hardened tubes, not non collapsible tubes that allow the, the uh, outside air into the inside, and it gets distributed by uh, osmotic motion, essentially. And you can see it's, it's true uh, for both the uh, adult and the larva. So it's a very, very inefficient system in as much as there's no real dedicated delivery system to all parts. There's no dedicated mixing of, of the blood with oxygen, okay? And then we get to the, the blood, you know, the, the, the dorsal part uh, is, is, is kind of amazing. They call this an aorta, or somebody has in the past. I really don't think, I think thoracic chamber of the heart is probably reasonable. What it really boils down to is that this whole thing all along the dorsum there is, is, is a closed system, and it has various places along the way where there's ports, you see, these ports. And the whole deal with the, this, the, uh, the heart is it beats, and it, it, it shoves liquid into what's called the hemocele. That's this whole thing is a hemocele. It's kind of an open chamber. There's no distribution of the of the blood in a regular uh, pattern of veins or arteries. Okay, no recirculation. So it's just again a very very inefficient system, but it works really well at small scales. And butterflies happen to be at small scales. Now the ventral portion of, of the uh, of the abdomen, thorax head, you know, is where all of the uh, 
the nervous system is. I'm going to probably jump ahead. There, there we go. The nervous system wire. And you can see that there's a well established system of, of, uh, of nerves into all parts. I mean, these obviously incomplete. These nerves will actually go virtually to every cell in the body, just like uh, nerves uh, do uh, pretty much in, in uh, most creatures. You can see that there's an, a cephalic uh, ganglion, a thoracic ganglion, and there's several other ganglia along the way. Now these are all basically reflexive nodes so that the butterfly doesn't have to get messages from the brain to certain parts of the abdomen uh, to get things done, all right? And these are, are both in terms of uh, uh, functional uh, systems, and also, but, but primarily mostly motion, you know, and, and copulation, so, as a matter of fact. Now, the concentration in the, uh, the, cerebr the cerebral area is, is largely because there's so many senses that are, are uh, associated. Of course, the eyes, which is a big deal for a butterfly. You know, it's a flying creature. It has these huge eyes, as we saw it. Back of pace. I mean, big eyes, right? And it's important that those eyes, uh, you know, operate or function at a, 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 a fairly, um, you know, high rate of, of accuracy for the butterfly to negotiate its environments and, and uh, escape. Yeah? Are there nerves and blood in the wings? Uh, there's no, only trachea. The wings are essentially otherwise dead. You know, there's, uh, at, at when they emerge from a, a pupa, there's a momentary situation where there's this material called meconium, which is a blood-like uh, uh, substance which is actually circulated with some of the heart uh, pumping action um, in, into the wings to get them expanded. But they're soon thereafter evacuated and uh, otherwise the veins have just air in them. But again, it's not pumped air into them, it's air that's that's getting into them, you know, you know, in a sort of a vague way, uh, as it is in the whole respiratory system. All right. Um, it shows the brain and the head. Do all insects have brains in their heads? Well, it's, I just call it a cerebral ganglion. Is what I'd call it, because it's not really a brain. It's like a center, a place where things that are happening all in the head, which includes okay, the antennae, which are really important in terms of sensing um, chemi chemicals in the air. Very important in terms of um, orientation. Your antennae act as sort of this balancing thing, and they have thing called Johnson's organs, which are at the base of the antennae, which are antennae are very important for um, keep, keeping balance and keeping orientation. So when you have, and then food is being, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of sensory things going on there. It's very important to have what nervous system you have. And I hope you realize this is a pretty pulpy nervous system. I mean, they're not thinking great thoughts. They just don't have the nervous material. They really don't have the nerve, nervous material uh, to even experience pain. Pain is something that, is like when a butterfly, is a useless sentiment, you know? I so. asked because once I, I had a uh, dragonfly, I think I may have accidentally decapitated it while swinging the net. Right. And it lived for days uh, without its head. And I thought, well, right. it would have found it, it, it wouldn't have been able to me. hunt. What? It wouldn't have been able to hunt without its yeah. head. But well, it couldn't see or eat. Right. But I just didn't really know what was missing. Right. Well, the, the thing is that the rest of the body had either uh, enough for sustenance and it had the, these other ganglia which were serving the purpose. You know, you hear about a stegosaurus supposed to have a, a brain in its hindquarters. Well, that's, a, you know, that's probably not really true, but this is more, more true than that. These act as, uh, these, these particularly act as, as like brain effects or reflexive actions, but they, they actually keep the systems operating. Yeah, man. Um, so, how did the dragonfly exactly keep moving? Does it have its brain somewhere else in its body? Yeah, right. See, the, the, the thoracic ganglia in there would, would deal with a lot of that stuff. Now, it couldn't get, you know, for instance, it couldn't fly anywhere because it wasn't getting directions from the cerebral, gang, cerebral ganglion to give it directions to say, hey, you need to go there, there's something to eat there. I mean, they weren't getting any of those. It could have flapped its wings, it could have moved its legs and its abdomen, um, you know. But, but re reflexively, again, it wasn't direct motion. All right. I wanted to go back, I think, uh, to the, yeah, the excretion system, okay? Now, how do you get rid of, of waste? That's always going to be a problem with a living thing. Well, if you uh, think about what, what uh, butterfly adults eat, they're basically eating really high quality sugar products, which just burned up. There's not a lot of waste product. There are some that it has to get rid of, but um, the, the, the waste products of, of, of the, uh, the muscle tissues, as they're flying, you're creating lactic acid and whatnot, and those things have to be uh, gotten rid of. And that's all gotten rid of through these malpighian tubules. Yeah. A good name for a band. Huh? Good name for a band. It, it is actually, and only you would think of that. Don't <laughs> yeah, malpighian tubules, and they, they end up evacuating it all into the, into the 
the waste. And we'll talk more about what butterflies eat because they do eat amino acids and they pick up a lot of other stuff and, and that makes it more complicated, but it actually makes the malpeptian tubule functions more important as well. And the larva on the other hand is an eating machine, so its whole waste system is, 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 is more highly evolved than in the adults, or at least more highly expressed as a developmental function. And, and so uh, these malpighian tubules, which if you ever do a dissection on, on a caterpillar, they become very evident, they're obvious, they're, they're the, you know, like stringy white things that you can see very clearly, especially if they've already been preserved. All right, I um, basically want to move on to the, the, the functional aspects here. We're talking about, um, people ask me, how come I go females first? Because really, uh, males are just useless bags of gametes. And uh, the female is the reproductive unit. And this is the basic reproduction system. Uh, you know, you have the ovaries that you, uh, you know, everyone, you think about a sexually reproducing organism, ovaries pr produce eggs, and the eggs are, as you can see there, eggs are being pushed along here. This is what they call the bursa. And this is where, when there's, uh, when, when, when the, uh, when butterflies mate, you know, the, the male deposits the spermatophore here, and then the, the, uh, the sperm duct goes in as, and, and fertilizes the egg on its way out. This is a very stylized lighting because it, is, it, it won't remind you of any butterfly that anyone's ever seen. This is uh, part of a, a, of a book written by Jim Scott, which is a great introduction to butterflies. This chapter on the butterflies themselves is pretty uh, worthless. That's most of the book, but his introductory portions are really, really good. And then this is another uh, stylized, and I'm using actually the, the, the technical terms, you know. Bursa is Latin for purse. Come on, you guys. You didn't know that? Copulatrix, you know what that is. Uh, corpus bursa is the body of the purse. Ductus bursa is the duct. Ostium is the, the mouth, okay. And that's, that's basically, okay, now the male genitalia structure is really quite different. I've always likened this to being very similar to the Russian um, uh, spacecraft, the Soyuz. If you guys know the Soyuz spacecraft, anybody here know the Soyuz spacecraft? Not personally. Well, you've seen pictures. Come on, give me a hard time, will you? <laughs> All right. Come on, I, I need some help here. Soyuz has. They have these. We're too young, John. Three <laughs> flaps, and they basically, you know, they can come in at several different angles, but as long as these three different devices, um, the receptor and the, it's a male, female, and okay. <laughs> Fooey. Um, these, these things here are called the valves. And these valves and this hook up here act essentially as placement and, and, and positioning scaffolding for the male and the female. Uh, and and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because uh, and all of that's, you know, it's really exciting. Has anybody seen butterflies mate? Oh. Yeah, they're extremely ardent, you know. And, and, they're real excited about it, and that's that's going to lead into the, my whole uh, my whole swallowtail coming down the right here. You swung your little pointer all over the place. Which constituted the valves? Okay, well these are the valves here. These are basically lateral uh, lenticular form or or uh, lamelliform structures. They have substructures, but basically they're just kind of like wall-like appendages. Let's see again, you know, right there, that valve. And then this is the uncus, which as you see has sort of a, a hook kind of a deal, and then the two little things on the side. Not every butterfly um, has all of this paraphernalia. They kind of do the stylized thing to, to show what you might see. You know, again, the same uncus and these lateral processes. All of this is like a positioning kind of thing. And when, when the butterflies get to doing their thing, it is, it's, a, it's a real interesting thing. Um, I had a guy that was, um, I don't know where he went with this. I never talked to him once he... Uh, once he got on the train and left my place. Uh, but he was freeze drying butterflies in the act of copulation, Jeez. embedding them in uh, this substance, Epon, I think it is, that they do thin slices. And, and he was looking at the juxtapositions of all the different, uh, uh, you know, things as they were doing their, their deal. And I mean, it's really amazing. Butterflies are actually pretty simple. And some of the moths, you wouldn't believe some of the conformations. They have, okay, this is. This is what this is essentially ediagus, you know, this is a penis is what it is. But this inside here, there's a, a reversible sac. It's like inverted now, but when it's when they all get excited, it comes out and it, it has you know a conformation. It's actually very very same, much the same in each species. It sometimes can be different between species, so it has taxonomic value. But in moths, 
Some of these are outrageous. They look like they're ten times as big as the as the penis itself, and they're convoluted and twisted, and they have all kinds of teeth on. Interesting thing, the females. What, what did you say was ten times as big as the penis itself? You got to pay attention, dude. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, I'll try. Oh. See this deal here? All right. This is the penis. All right, and there's a sac that's everted inside. And when they get excited, they evert it. Okay. And, and I was hoping you wouldn't drag me through the muck. <laughs> you probably not. I did. You know, I mean, it's a tender subject. And I think somebody sensed that and went for the blood. There. All right. Anyway. Uh, We'll just move on from there. <laughs> well, this is an example. This is from Scudder's Butterflies of New England, a classic work that's online. It's free, you know, download. It's showing uh, the various different conformations of, uh, just, just as an example of all the different kinds of shapes and, and why, you know, uh, people might find it interesting to look at these things and, and to make comparisons, all right? Now we get into uh, the, the actual, going back to the life cycle thing, okay? Just going to go through this uh, fairly quickly because I mean you all know we just saw Dave kind of give us a rundown on, on, on the gizmo. The egg is an interesting uh, phenomenon for a couple of different uh, reasons. One is that it really doesn't have much behavior. It's almost entirely dependent on where the female puts it. Okay. Now um, this last uh, September I saw uh, this is something I've seen quite a bit, but I saw it last September again uh, a hydaspe fritillary laying an egg on a clod of dirt and. I know there was violence there. In the spring, I'd come there and be violence there. How that female knew there were violence there means that they have sensitivities that, well, and I may be metaphysical. I, well, and I may be. Yeah? That's that, that white thing hanging off the top on the left there, we see that sometime on the age. Do you know what that is? Well, I suspect that it's a remnant of one of the scales that was around the annelid, uh, the papilla at the end of the uh, uh, female's abdomen. Um, this is an electron uh, uh, a microscope, so it means that it also got plated with gold. It may be an artifact. So what's, a, what's he talking about exactly? He's talking about these, these, these things here, right? Yeah, sometimes we see them frequently on, on eggs. Uh, well, then I would, I would guess mostly pyarid eggs. Yeah. Okay, the, the, the shape itself probably lends itself to linear uh, uh, you know, accumulation of scales. I, I would suggest that's probably what it is. That's but, a period, right? Right. It's a pyrid, and, and it's very important. The egg has all of the genetic information that's going to make that butterfly. There's a butterfly represented inside of that. That's incredibly small. This is what, what do you say, half a millimeter? Well, the pyrid egg would probably be a little bigger, one and a quarter. One and a quarter millimeters? Well, yeah. oh, literally giant, right? Yeah. So we're talking, uh, but all of the information is, but on the other hand, if it gets laid in the wrong place, that egg can't do anything about it. Eggs are called upon to uh, sometimes go through the winter as, a, as an egg. Sometimes they're submerged for three or four months at a time. Sometimes they're exposed, like some of our Saturnian hair streaks, uh, the California hair streak, bears, and, uh, and silver. Those hair streaks are they're going through the winter on an exposed willow or persia branch uh, to the temperatures that can be 10, 15 below. And so they're really asked to do a lot um, in terms of survival, but they're not asked to do much in terms of moving around. Now, and these are some images of a number. I like these are, are skipper eggs. This one? Yeah. You don't think that is? No. All right. That's probably a lichenid. I just grabbed this off the list. That's Papiliana. That's a pirate. That's probably uh, an invalid guy. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a pirate. So I don't really know what that one is. But probably another lichenid, huh? But they, they come in all shapes and sizes. Yeah, man. John, do the, uh, the eggs have any natural predators in the insect world? Absolutely. There's nothing around that's alive that doesn't have something to feed on it. Yeah, there are predators that will uh, predate on eggs. Some of them are uh, actually uh, uh, predator bugs that are designed to you know, prey on all insects, but what's better than an egg that's just sitting there and can't run away? So yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there are also uh, wasps, tiny, tiny little wasps that uh, parasitize uh, the eggs. And, Parasitoids are a part of every single uh, stage in, in a butterfly's life, life history, including the adults. They hit riders. There was a question waiting on you. Does the female produce eggs at a standard rate, like 10 a day? It, no, it, it, it's variable. There's some uh, females come out uh, pretty much ready to blow them out as soon as uh, they get mated, and they can do three or 400 at a time. So uh, other butterflies do have, like heliconians in the tropics, they have a developmental rate that that might be more in the order of what you described, 10 or, or 15 a day, and then they generate some more. But the heliconians are long-lived, and they actually use 
uh, non-nectar sources for food plants, so they have a sustenance issue that gives them an advantage as well. We'll move along to that. Look, I'm telling you, there's more than anyone can do in a single night, so I'm trying to make sure uh, that, that you actually your questions are appropriate if they do bring these questions. Yeah? Do the butterflies employ a chemical or structural defense mechanisms for the eggs? Well, now, it's interesting that you should ask. There, some <laughs> eggs are covered in scales. You know, I mean, more than more moths than butterflies, uh, but there's at least a couple of hair streaks that get plastered to the the willows, uh, for instance, uh, with a, a shellac that might actually serve a similar purpose, make it hard for a bug to come along and suck the contents out. But there's really nothing uh, anti-predatory uh, except the placement of the eggs themselves. And yeah. David James just found something interesting with the fine whites. He found that on the on the egg hatch. The larvae will eat the eggs on either side that haven't hatched yet, so they're turned this afternoon. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, that's getting a meal in a hurry, and if you decide that you have to eat pine trees, that's probably not a bad idea, you know. So, and there may be reasons for that too, is that, you know, the presence of the eggs, they're, they're usually brightly colored, right? Mm -hmm. So if they, you know, emerge first, they get rid of anything that might attract another predator, you know. Uh, that's the speculation on my part. This is pie arid eggs. Uh, Eggs can be laid in groups, sometimes very large groups. I mean, they're so good at uh, hiding and, and staying to me. Well, it, 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 most, most of what I can tell, uh, there's the eggs that aren't going to go into diapause, because any egg that's going into diapause is probably committed to that as soon as it's laid. Okay, but any egg that is not going to diapause, uh, it goes through a period of development that's almost entirely contingent on. Uh, mostly temperature, I would think, some moisture. All right, so this it's like a timed out thing. You know, if if, if there's no, they can't hatch within a certain time, they can't hatch before that. I mean, it takes them so long to develop. But any time after that could be a product of, of the temperature. That's that's generally uh, going to be the case. Again, if you're committed to diapause, you're going no matter what. So, uh, and then subsequently, when you break diapause, then you have that issue of how long it takes to develop, and that would be temperature dependent again. And some, some of these things, these are uh, polygonia, and uh, sometimes these things get chained like this. It could be as many as three or four of them uh, chained together. I've seen that, actually. I've come across uh, satyrus eggs chained on the underside of, a, of a, uh, a nettle leaf. And I, when I looked at it, when I saw it, I knew what I was seeing, but I couldn't believe it. It was like, holy cow. I mean, first of all, I'm thinking, that must not be that easy to do, you know, to lay eggs like that. But uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, what governs grouping or not grouping eggs? Because, like, if you go back uh, here, th this is a, a pyarid. In fact, several pyarids in the old world uh, feed gregariously as larvae. Well. One that's actually pretty close to our, our cabbage white relationship white, Pyarus brassicae, the large white. Um, you know, they feed gregariously and, and they, their eggs are laid. Close. Whereas uh, Pyarus rapi, our, uh, our cabbage white, never does so. so I, it's an interesting phenomenon. David and I couldn't figure out what this is. You get, you get any closer? No. All right. That's a light, uh, light candid. That's actually a copper uh, egg. Now, you see this little thing here? It's a copper shade? It's, a, uh, it's made of copper, butterfly copper type. Not made out of copper. You see, see that little thing right there? That's called a micropile. That's where uh, the gamete, uh, the sperm, mm -hmm. joins with the egg as it's being fertilized. And you might look at these things as being sort of semi-crystalline. They're actually protonaceous and they're not actually crystalline, but they have sort of that aspect because when they evacuate the egg and you look at the eggshell, it's really clear. It's like it's very, very thin. Mm -hmm. So everything that's going on there, development, I, I would imagine that they actually um, start to digest the inner elements of that egg um, as they get closer and closer to uh, uh, emergence. Just pretty much the same as, as a pupa becomes thinner and thinner closer it gets to emergence. That's a swallowtail egg. And there's a uh, potential predator. Um, what and, is that thing? Um, I'm thinking that it's, it's a, uh, a wasp. Yeah, um, I'm, not wasp. Sure, I'm not sure that it's one of the um, parasitoid wasps. And that doesn't really look like, does it look like a wasp to you? Looks like it might. A might? Kidding. It might be. Oh. Now, this is, uh, this picture serves several uh, purposes all at once. This is a butterfly laying eggs. And, one thing I want you to notice is, just you know, just look at this thing. Would you think that this was good to eat? Yes. No. 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 It's, it's like so. This butterfly is not really concerned about anything except uh, laying those eggs, and you know, it's not really going to be under attack. I will get into that real shortly, but I wanted to, to include that picture because it does show a butterfly laying eggs. 
Now, a caterpillar, this is even okay. It's simple. Yeah? Uh, Don't ask me another one like that. <laughs> why are the larvae of various butterfly species so picky about what they eat? Why are they finicky? Why are the why larvae, larvae of various butterfly species so picky on what they eat? Well, you know, since we're moving right on into that subject here, I might be able to answer that in a short minute. How about you think? That's you know, not the right answer. Well, that's going to be the right answer. <laughs> this, this, is a, this is another picture of uh, some larvae from Scudder's Butterflies in New England. This is available online. This is 18, late 1800s, and uh, it's a great little, little bug. And this is another, you know, basic setup, okay? you got basically four pairs of pro legs, which are false legs. you got three sets of uh, the real true legs, which will become the the legs of the adult butterfly and the basic elongated uh, eruca form larva. And uh, they're fantastic, okay? Yeah. When you say pro legs and they're not real legs, is that they do they function or they, they function but they're not they're not structurally part of a, a leg of the adult butterfly. They're pro legs in the sense that they you know, they serve a function as legs in the larva, but they don't okay. you notice know, so they're structurally you see right. these are yeah. jointed like arthropod legs, whereas these are just essentially uh, skin flaps that are modified into grasping devices. But now we get into the issue of why do the butterfly larvae eat the, uh, the particular plants that, that they seem to be. I mean, some, some butterfly larvae aren't very picky, you know. Some actually uh, are picky, but not in a, in a, in a uh, specific sense. They're in a, 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 like they eat fruits, but they'll eat fruits of a lot of different plants. They'll eat flowers, flowers of a lot of different plants. Others are extremely specific to like the butterfly we talked about tonight, the, the Freya, it's, it's um, almost on one plant only, and uh, and it'll stay with that plant, you know, and, and wherever you go, you'll see it associated with that plant. Or the, uh, what's, hoary elfin, is that polios? Yeah. Yeah, oh, hoary elfin is strictly on our Distaphylos universi, Um This is not a, a, a why question so much as it is like that's what they've done to exploit this niche and they've specialized. So they, you know, could might be a bad choice sometime in the future where Kinnicknick becomes a, a rare or endangered plant in its habitat and they become extinct because of their uh, specialization on it. But in a time where that plant is a, almost a, a subdominant plant under, in the understory, then that, you know that's a good thing to do to specialize on that because you can make hay in a lot of different places. But in this particular case, now there's another, if you had to guess, would you say that was good to eat? Well, you got a couple of reasons why it's not. First of all, it's like black and white, it's real strikingly marked. And then, you know, you get these things here. That doesn't look like it'd be real friendly. These things feed on passion uh, vines, passiflora. And, and they're, uh, they sequester toxic compounds. These are heliconians. And, and, and they, um, as a result, uh, they sequester these toxic compounds and things that decide they might want to try to eat them, uh, usually regret it, uh, for more reasons than getting uh, spine to the roof of their mouth. Other caterpillars are, you know, like more nondescript and maybe like they're hiding out. That's a cabbage white larva. You guys seen them on your cabbages in the backyard. They, yeah. they, they do some damage uh, to the cabbage. I mean, you know, they're not even a native, you know, butterfly, but okay. And this is an orange tip larva, and uh, you can see that in a way, it's kind of a, it's kind of a cryptic looking thing. You can imagine if it was on an herbaceous plant, in you know, uh, in, in, in the linear markings and the linear, um, the long, elongated shape. It's really accentuated, you know, it kind of blends, kind of tapers to a tip, and it's really hard to see. It's hard to see, so it's kind of cryptic. But um, there's just, and this is that uh, that that cabbage, uh, the the large white that I was talking about that feeds gregariously in, uh, in England and Europe. Uh, I, I would suspect, and since cabbage family plants support mustard oils, I would suspect that this thing's probably toxic. And that feeding in a group and looking like that is probably a good thing for it, so that you know things wouldn't feed on it. But we'll get this is a skipper larva of a, I'm thinking it's a uh, Proteus, or Radish Proteus, the long tail, the Proteus long tail skipper. And, uh, and pretty typical of most skippers because it's got that constriction right behind the head there, you know, and then it's got this sclerotized first segment. Very, very typical, typical skipper. Anybody tell me what that is? I know you can, David. Anybody else? It's a bird turd. That's really good, actually. It's, it's supposed to look like that. Uh, that's an admiral, Limonitis. And the whole group of our work ones looks like this. This is probably uh, the eastern uh, uh, Arthemis. But, I mean, you know, that's really odd looking thing. It's got lumps and protuberances and everything. It's, it's supposed to look 
uh, unusual enough that you know, it doesn't look like it's something they eat. And then there's a typical lichened larva, which is kind of slug-like, and it moves kind of slowly. And, 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 you know, like, and then here, this is one of my favorites. This is a Southeast Asian, uh, it's actually a limonitine, or at least people, it's a phalia. It's, it, it doesn't have a, a, a common name that I know. Um, but it's, that's an amazing looking thing. It doesn't have spines all the way up and down its back. It's just got them out laterally here. And a pretty spectacular set of spines. And another one, this is from South America. This is uh, an owl. It's an Oxifanes owl butterfly. Check that out, you know. Now, to be honest with you, I, 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 even though I, you might look at that and say, well, I don't know if I'd want to chomp down on that. But this is not a butterfly, or a larva that's, that's uh, trying to look like something um, that you don't want to eat. Uh, they're trying to look poisonous or trying to look fierce. I don't know what the whole head ornamentation thing is in there, but it's, it's kind of a cool looking thing anyway. And this is our painted lady. Uh, again, anyone who's handled painted ladies knows that these spines really aren't that sharp, but they don't look like they're not that sharp. And so, you know, somebody that's coming along and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm hungry, I'm going to try to take, you know, get me some. Uh, they look at that and they probably, uh, you know, choose not to, you know, at least on, on uh, first grounds. And again, you know, these things are probably toxic. And so the black and orange and white stripe thing is like, you know, letting predators know that, hey, you know, the last time I bit into one of those, it wasn't good for me and I'm not going to mess with it anymore. John? Yeah. So these the, um, species that are unappetizing. Are the eggs also unappetizing? Mm, you know, I've seen it. You know, no, generally not. It's almost as if the eggs have certain kind of limitations on what you can do. Well, first of all, they're so small, there's not much surface area that you can work with to look an unappetizing. Best thing you can do with an egg is be obscure. So, but in the cases where eggs are uh, belong to creatures that are not, uh, that are, that are, are not uh, good to eat, um, like euphibious checker spots, they cluster them together and they're nice bright yellow orange cluster. So in a way they're very conspicuous and I think predators can say, hey, you know, but insect predators aren't really affected by toxins. So most eggs are not going to be predated on by uh, vertebrate predators. They're going to be insect predators. Not much you can do. It's a gamble, you know, it's, it's the gamble that every arthropod takes, you know, you spread as many gametes in the environment and, and then what you get left, you know, is, is what survives. And, you know, that's, that's just the way selection operates. But no, you know, eggs really don't have a lot of, uh, now these are some nice small tails. Now there's another one of your bird thingies, you know. Bird jerks. Yeah. Yep. Um, it was about the caterpillar. The cat. It was about the caterpillar before this. Um, did did the butterflies they grow into are are toxic? This one here. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people that would say yes. Um, there's a problem that that we have as researchers, and that is that like um, I'd have to really you know eat one to decide for myself. Now, I did eat a monarch one time. You won't get me doing that again. <laughs> really did you eat a monarch? Huh? Did you really eat a monarch? Oh, well, I took some bites, okay? I'm not going to get into it, you know? But, uh, there's, a classic, uh, there's a classic work done by uh, Brower, uh, Andy Brower's dad, uh, where he got uh, blue jays, inexperienced blue jays, to eat monarchs. And, and it was uh, published in Scientific American. And on the cover of the Scientific American, uh, it was a blue jay puking, you know. So, I mean, we're talking about, that's, I didn't want to get to that stage. It's a powerful emetic, right? Yep. So, going back to your experience with this monitor, so yeah. did you notice anything? Did it taste, what, what? Um, yeah, I noticed that it tasted very distasteful. Yeah. Whereas other butterflies I've eaten haven't been. You know? okay. <laughs> Come on, sick, that's right? fair. Yeah. yeah. Was it John, what I'm wondering is, um, you talked a while ago about when the one uh, butterfly hatched, it would eat the other eggs, I guess. That oh, that was Dave, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, my, my question is, I know in your book you've done a catalog, you catalog butterflies that are, uh, are natural to, let's say, France, England, and other parts of the world. If those butterflies would be would be introduced into, let's say, over the winter area, would they start to impact the natural? Much like bringing in fish that aren't native to those waters, they start to, to be predators on that. The, There's the not a clear fish. answer to that question, okay? Because we have one butterfly, the cabbage white, the little white ones everybody sees in our city streets. That's a non-native butterfly. So at least one we know came from Europe and did quite well here. Uh, 
There's uh, uh, Agnes urticae, which is the peacock uh, that's established a few colonies in North America. And it feeds on, on nettles, so it should really be able to do pretty well, but it's not necessarily. But another answer to that is in Hawaii, where they had at one time only two native butterflies. Now they've got 16 species there. So some species can be brought in and do quite well. Do, so, do they feed off the native species? Yeah, no, no, they don't feed on the native butterflies. They feed on other plants that the other butterflies didn't so exploit. So they would be in competition, so hence the, yeah. the, the native would suffer. The whole problem with competition, it's hard to describe in terms of the head-to-head. -head. What they may do is actually supply a reservoir where uh, parasitoids can use them and, and then jump over to the native species. And so they actually create an, an opportunity that the parasitoids otherwise wouldn't have. So yeah, there's all, it's, hard, it's really hard to talk about like competition and or success, and, and, and we have a hard time even planting native butterflies into habitats that we prepared for them for that purpose, yeah. We've got a nice testing situation here in Washington right now with the European stipper coming in two different sides. Yeah. It would be real interesting to see what happens to the native butterflies. Yeah, we've got two two butterflies actually that are going to be in Puget Sound before I croak, you know, which is kind of cool because uh, Seattle is like the world's worst butterfly habitat. If we get two more, that, like what, that doubles what we got or something? <laughs> yeah, anyway, so the one of them is the European skipperling, which definitely will get here for sure. The other one is the uh, sacum, which it looks like it might. Yeah. So, so John, what would be your view if, if a colleague from Germany or so, let's say said they wanted to come over and plant a species in a certain area? Would you be in favor of that or would you? Well, be, it's not. I mean, the government would have something to say about it. Yeah, that's illegal. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, like, um, it's questionable whether um, they're, they're, the egg is the peacock. That's a laboratory animal. So it's questionable whether somebody doing research on that let some butterflies go. And that's where they got established where they are in, a, in the places where they are. Uh, I, I don't know that that is true, but it's interesting that, that one of the animals that has become semi-established was a laboratory animal. And so like, they do have, yeah, they, they, they frown on it. The government frowns on that stuff. And, uh, me personally, I mean, I don't see how a peacock added to our fauna could really hurt a thing. You guys ever seen a picture of a peacock? Yeah. That's the most outstanding boreal butterfly that anyone could ever, you know, imagine. Which, which kind of peacock? Huh? Which one? It's the, the it's called the peacock. I don't know. It's, Not it's, the white peacock. No, no, no. It's the Anacus, uh, uh, Aglius I.O., I think, or Nymphalus I.O. Anyway, these are swallowtail caterpillars, and you can see these are bird turd mimics. We're going to talk about the, All right. Another one. This is a Shirax, and again, more horns and everything. Okay, so like, okay, now we're to the pupae. Now we're going to fly, okay? More scudders, pictures of pupae, more pupae. Now, there's a certain kind of pupae that hang up with these uh, uh, little little thready things here, and, and, you know, they have this rather form of the swallowtails and the pyres do that, and, uh, and that's kind of a cool swallowtail, isn't it? Yeah. And that's a graphium species from How a, a kite from... Huh? How do they do that? How do well, they do that? the larvae actually, they form That's this so girdle and they, then so they flip amazing. it over their back. They, you know, they don't have a neck so they can kind of just do backwards and then once they get it in place, it's, it's all set and then they, they, they go, it's really pretty cool to watch them do it. I mean, it. how they put that, that, what do you call it, the, um, this, the silk uh, yeah. girdle? How do they do that? They build the girdle first and, and then when they get to the point where they want to, they just kind of, they're, they can, you know, they're wormy squirmies, you know, they kind of, you know, they'll take it with their jaws and flip it over their head. Mm -hmm. And this is what a butterfly looks like as it's emerged from the pupa. You can see, you know, that those Alex, wings are unexpanded. Yeah. It's you know, kind of a, uh, yeah. It looks more like, like um, a parasite and butterfly actually kind of. Where? That one. Oh, that looks. That's a butterfly. It just has. I know. It just has some blood all its blood out. And lycanid butterflies also have a silky girdle, but uh, well, that's kind of a cool one, huh? Yeah. 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 But most, most of the nymphalids and almost all the rest of the butterflies hang from a single, and that's a pretty much of a trip too, you know, how do you get that, you know, they're, they're shedding their skin, how do they reach back and catch that little silken knob with the, the butt end of that uh, crystal, it's just pretty, uh, it's pretty hard to do. Anybody know what that one is? Mark. Well, you guys are good. Alright, so we were talking about di uh, diapause before, but basically is that, you know, in the north you've got a time of the year that's not acceptable for growth, that's winter time, okay? In the tropics, it could be a dry season, or it could even be a wet season. So diapause through these seasons, that is a, a stage of, of uh, you know, shutting down your, your, uh, your, your system. You have to shut it down. So this is the winter up here. It could be uh, you know, any other time in the tropics. It could be dry or wet. 
And, and the idea here is that the various different times, the X is marked in the changeover from, you know, like in the top line is ova, hatches to larva, you know, goes to a pupa, then the adult and the adult lays an ova. And so like you can see is that it overwinters as, as a larva, as an as a, a ova, as, a, as an egg. Second line is the larval uh, stage that overwinters or diapauses, and the third line is the pupa, and then there's a number of butterflies that diapause as adults, and this is pretty important, okay? And the other thing you have to think about in terms of butterfly biology is how many broods they can have in a year. Now, uh, you can have a single brood. It could be early, middle, or late in the year, depending on, you know, when the larvae, or when the early stage is diapause. So, something that diapauses as an adult lays eggs, has all summer to develop, and, you know, develops into an adult that diapauses, that could be uh, late in the year. Now something that uh, diapauses as, a, as a, a pupa is ready to go in the spring, so its first brood is right off the bat and then it develops to a pupa the rest of the year, it's not present. It's interesting to note that in terms of talking about butterflies, most of the life of a butterfly is spent as an egg, a larva, or, or a pupa. The adult stage is, is ephemeral, it's very, very short lived. Only one thing that adults have to do and that is reproduce. No, disperse. No. Whoa. All right, so now we get to the thing we're talking about, mimicry. We're going to get to, yeah. So how long is the normal life of the... Well, it, 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 it's somewhere longer than others. Obviously, adults that diapause over the winter have a very long lifetime, but most of that is, you know, as an inactive adult hiding out someplace. Monarchs have a long lifespan. Heliconians have a long lifespan, but most butterflies are probably 10 days. Yeah, or maybe less. Would there be a big difference between the, the lifespan of a butterfly that lived in the tropics and let's say in a cold? Sometimes, but not always. Sometimes the tropical ones are pretty ephemeral too, you know. But their their whole goal is to get as many generations off in a row. Yeah. Um so what exactly would be the lifespan of like a swallowtail and queen? Probably like as a caterpillar. Probably oh the whole? Yeah. One year. Yeah, sure. You lay an egg one year and it comes out as an adult the next year. Simple. One year. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? Unless it was a two year swamp. I don't know. All right, now this is we're getting into mimicry. What do butterflies do to protect themselves from, from predation? We did talk a little bit about what caterpillars do, and we're going to see some more. This is like the coolest one, and one of the ones that, that people found out right away. Um, it turns out this is actually. Uh, it was thought to be Batesian mimicry, but it's not uh, Batesian mimicry, it's actually um, both Batesian and Mullerian. The model is the uh, Phylonor, the, uh, the, the, the Aristolum, I don't know, what's the common name for the, for Phylonor? Oh, the pipeline. Pipeline, yeah, pipeline swallowtail. Extremely toxic, feeds on a, a plant, Aristolochia, that you know, has so many different poisons in it that people just can't figure out how, how, how they can eat it, you know, including that butterfly. Now the, the Troilus on the upper uh, left is, uh, you know, is quite palatable, and it, you know, is not a, a it's a Batesian mimic. And remind us what Batesian mimic. Batesian mimic is where the, the, the mimic is not toxic. The, the, the model's toxic, the mimic is not toxic, okay? Same with Polycines, the black swallowtail. Uh, by the way, Troilus is a spice bush swallowtail. And then the eastern tiger swallowtail has two forms. It's polymorphic. It has two these two forms, and that the female is, is mimicking uh, the pipeline, and it's also not toxic. But uh, the limonitis is in fact a toxic butterfly. Yeah. Uh, John, I got to ask you again. Um, you said that when they're in their larval stage, I believe that that, that they have many predators, including the wasp. Um, I'm wondering when the butterfly is in its most advanced in its adult, adult stage. stage. Yeah. I, I was led to believe that birds and that type of stuff, what is their main predator? When well, I would, I, you know, that's a, been a great question. Not very many people have seen a lot of bird predation, but I think uh, we have to suspect that most of the bird predation that takes place isn't in the, in, in the air. So those of us who are watching butterflies, see them flying, are not going to see the, the times and places where birds will get them. Now you think about birds foraging through bushes and stuff, when, when butterflies hang up for the night or when they're you know, resting, they're, they're subject to predation then. I'd say birds are probably the number one predator in the higher latitudes, but that is pretty much unproven, although we can see a lot of bird marks on their wings, so we, you know, we have our suspicions. Yeah? I'm going to just have this little question in my head. You see which now? No, I don't. I just had this question, and I wanted to ask it. Um, so, when the parasites, do they infect the butterfly while they're in the egg or when 
they're just starting as a caterpillar. Oh, they do all of that. They'll, they'll go the eggs. They will fill the egg with their larvae, you know, because they do a polyembryonic thing. You know, they, they lay one egg, it divides, and then it'll eat the egg, and that egg will never hatch. Or they could lay them uh, on a larva and, and do the same thing to the larva. Uh, I don't know if there are pupal parasitoids. Yeah, but I've also heard that they'll lay the egg in the caterpillar, the caterpillar will go on the slide, and then the wasp will come out and eat. Right. Well, no, the, the larva eats the caterpillar, and it comes out, and then it goes yeah, through its cycling cycle. Yeah. Or, or flies, they have flies too. Anyway, uh, Spiria diana, that's a fritillary, okay? It's diana fritillary. Most fritillaries, you all know it. Hey, we looked at a lesser fritillary and like they're boring, so having a, a blue one like that's pretty unusual. And you can see that, that the mimicry thing is working. Now these are all uh, parts of mimicry rings, and you can see there's three things that are, are important. One, one you have to recognize is that there's a certain kind of, of, of bright, Contrasting colors, usually black, reds, whites, and uh, and yellows. Okay, and you can you can see that there. Sometimes it's nice to have bands and or spots or stripes, and and then of course this is the classic one. This is another case in point. This turns out to be a Mullerian mimicry complex too, where the monarch is protected, and so is the viceroy. You know, looking at them closely, you can see that there's quite a bit of difference. So the tropics, Mullerian, both are chunks. Yes. Yes. And this is like, this is, I, I would like to spend more time on this, but this is crazy, man. There's moths in there, there's pyarids, there's dragonflies. I mean, these, and they are incredible, you know, I mean, uh, just, it, that one there's a swallowtail in the middle. The yeah, big one. Yeah, and swallowtails enter into these things unfrequently. Uh, uh, so, uh, mimicry is a very effective way to confuse. And generally speaking, um, mimicry works best when you have sort of a pattern. You can see that like, each of these represents you know, sort of different patterns, right? And, and, and it's nice to have enough of the same kind of pattern so that, you know, anything that's, you know, out there looking to eat something recognizes and leaves them all alone. Yeah? Is mimicry more, it, is it, it more common in butterflies than in, or Lepidoptera than in other? No, it's more obvious. I mean, we, we, yeah, we study butterflies because, well, it, it, it might be more common too because there's, it's, it's like butterfly wings, moth wings, are these big billboards, all right? And there's not a lot else out there that, that provides, uh, you know, I think that, that you might be right, there, that it may be more common in butterflies, but it's, it, you know, certainly uh, apparent in other things as well. Uh, butterflies and moths, they are just billboard creatures. I mean, that's one of the problems. That's the bane of a systematist. You got all these people looking at butterflies. All they do is look at the wings, they don't look at the structure. Uh, like the trailing to try to identify those things. Yeah, no, oh yeah, no, absolutely. And it goes on. You know, that. And then you can also look like something entirely, I don't know what that looks like, but it doesn't look like a caterpillar, does it? And, uh, and what, how about that? A monkey face? It looks like a yeti's face. Yeah, there's the, uh, uh, another rendition, and then there's the real thing, okay? Well, so now whether this is actually, I mean, who knows? It, it, it doesn't look like, I mean, it, it works. It's kind of like that face on the man on Mars, right? That, that whole yeah. image, you know, it could be an accident. Yeah. What does that look like? This is like totally cool. Well, I don't know if the guy set it up, but it's a caterpillar that looks like bird poo, and then there's a pile of bird poo to just to prove point, you know? Wow. That's really Which is which? Yeah, right. Yeah. Which is which? And then, you know, I don't know what that's, you know, supposed to look like. Supposed to represent like space. I mean, if you were this high and you ran into something like that, I'd be like, whoa! Oh my gosh! I mean, I'm thinking a bird, a bird with, you know, and the, and the same thing, the false face idea, the false eyes, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's pretty amazing, uh, uh, you know, I'd say, I hate to say that's exactly mimicry, it could be a flash effect, yeah. That big black line, does that, uh, uh, does that show up when the caterpillar is disturbed? Yeah, right, right, well, see how, okay, like, this is a fairly normal, uh, that looks like it's probably been poked a little bit. Species on that? Um, this one looks like uh, the, 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 the uh, eastern tiger swallowtail. This one is uh, Eurymodon, and I don't know what that one is. That could be Multicandata. So. Uh, it appeared to us that, yeah, the white line you can see in the black one's not there until you poke it. Then poke right, the black right. And they, they puff up the, the front end of it. Later on, we're going to see some other things. And then there's this, this is a nice little polymorphism. It's like butterflies that 
you know, have a lot of different forms. On top you see two, uh, a male on the left and a female, a normal female on the right. And then below you see all these mimetic forms of females, which is a, a polymorphic array. Polymorphic means many different forms. And you can see that each one of these looks like a different um, uh, toxic model, okay? You can see that one on the left, second row left is a uh, Danaid type model, and then another Danaid type uh, to its right. And then below, uh, there's a, still another Danaid type, and then on the, the bottom is a Creat, uh, an African toxic heliconia. Polyphenism. Uh, this is, oh no, this is uh, polymorphism, sorry. Uh, this is like a normal, uh, uh, what's Philodicy's common name? Clouded. Clouded. Normal clouded sulfur in the albinic form, and normal orange sulfur in the albinic form. These are uh, thought to be related to thermal regulatory uh, functions, and so like there may be some aspect of that that, uh, you know, uh, anything that's polymorphic that can you know, vary enough to meet the, the requirements of the environment is going to have an advantage. And then this is the difference between two different broods of the same butterfly. Uh, early brood has a very highly uh, marked uh, venation on the ventral hind wing, and the later broods are, are much less so. That's called polyphenism. You're going to see all of that, um, you know, as you're in the woods, you see early spring, late spring, uh, some are like early spring, uh, western whites are really green, and the later ones are virtually not uh, marked at all. Yes? I think I already asked this once, but uh, you folks talked about where there was a fire, and sometimes when there's a big burn, that species becomes extinct, basically. Um, I know you guys have been studying this for a long time because your book goes back to the 1700s. Have you guys noticed any pattern, like with the bee species, that global warming is, is doing something to the butterflies? Or well, that's, a, that's, that's like reality? two different uh, spectra. The global warming, yeah, we've noticed something like this, the Pleistocene, you know, the glaciers went away. So, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, burning is one thing. And uh, what I've noticed, my feeling is, when in doubt, burn it out. I mean, that's not so true in like local small areas, but in like forested areas, you got to get rid of those old trees, you know, they crap things out. So I'm all in favor of burning things. I don't take an active part of that now, don't get me wrong, but you know, enough of it happens by itself. So I, I personally think that um, these populations will rebound, you know, up there. You know, we'll probably see more fray of fertilizers in the next 10 years than we have in the last. Okay, now we're talking about flying. We've got, um, you know, really some interesting things that are important. You know, on, on one sense, you have migration that takes place in the monarch way, way over and around. It. And, and, and that's a big, big migration, but there's more important migrations that take place on the local level. Uh, seasonal migration is like the, uh, the California torch. Everybody, every spring, knows that you know, the California torch are down low in huge trough or out in the Columbia Basin. Then they move up um, during the course of the summer to the top. That's the bottom, uh, by the way, bottom deal. Uh, and then in the late summer, they move back down. Uh, that's pretty traditional for um, Milbert's tortoise shell as well. Um, and it's, it's not, uh, not unexpected. There are butter, other butterflies like western whites, maybe, that do the same thing. Uh, now, the inner habitat dispersal, I mean, these things have wings, so like, it's really important to understand that when you have wings, you can go places, all right? Inner habitat dispersal uh, occurs between um, you know, areas that are suitable, uh, between which there is, are areas that aren't suitable. So, you know, butterflies have the ability to go and find places. Uh, other than where they were born, to, to you know, material, materially disperse into uh, uh, larger and larger ranges. And then, you know, intra habitat dispersal. Every time he's walking uh, through a habitat, you see butterflies moving from nectar source to mud to, you know, uh, food plant. And, and these are all parts of, of their daily activities. So, you, butterflies are going to be doing all of these things uh, as you uh, observe them. And then, this is an example of uh, what, it, it, this is not. A scientific example. This is just an example of what I, uh, something like the uh, coleus erythemi might do in, in our state in a, in a given year. All right. Other things that butterflies can do is look like something that's not uh, scary. Look like something that's pretty average. Like if you, you know, if you even manage to see something like that, you mistake it for something else, like a leaf or uh, you know detritus. So that would look like a leaf. I mean, am I wrong? That is no. a really good. Thing. Yeah, that's a pretty good leaf mimic. And then there's things that look like moss. These are my favorite butterflies here. Things that look like, you know, uh, pale grass um, or, or pale rocks or, or you know, any number of, of different possibilities. It's like if you can look like something that, that is not edible, then you've escaped, you know, a lot of the possibilities. Or you can startle something. I mean, like, this is called an owl butterfly. It's not surprising. You know, if, if a, a small uh, bird. 
that's that's also not good to eat. You know, that's I mean, like you, you just you get the feeling that these things aren't good to eat, and this works uh, to to mimicry. It works for your own advantage. All right, now. Nutrition. What do butterflies do? They've got to eat. This is self-sustaining. And most of the butterflies use some kind of flower. You know, they, they use flowers, nectar sources, pure sugar, but they don't use just flour. What do you think they're eating there? Crab. You have such a way with words with them. Salt. Alright, there's more crab. Cut the crab. Yeah. Yeah. Like more crab. crab. There's just a lot of crap that these butterflies will eat. There's some bird crap. And there's some crap on somebody's socks. Really? It's not blood. They eat, you know, fruits. Rotten fruits. Rotten fruits, yes. I mean, and, uh, and they come to mud. And they're getting um, things from mud that, you know, besides water, because mud is fine, really? you know, for just the water. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Just getting nutrition, you know, just the, the value of those. All right. And you guys seen plenty of, of the butterflies on mud. Well, that's water alone, but they're also probably getting minerals, too, uh, probably uh, uh, for the, the mating sequence. I'm really trying to, oh. I knew I'd get to the sex part. I mean, that's why I'm hurrying, is to get to the sex part. All right. Now, problem with mating is you have to, how did I, I put it? I thought it was pretty, pretty nice. Well, it's very delicate, I think. Oh, yeah. Let's mate location. You know, mate location. If, if you're a female, it's not your job to find a mate. It's the male's job to find you. So males have to find... The, the females. Now there's ways to do this and, and this number one way to do it is to find a contrasting topography that would work. If you want to go to a hilltop that's cool. If you want to go to a valley bottom that's cool. But being generally distributed is not a good idea. It reduces the chances that you're going to come into contact. So you have hilltopping, you have valley bottom riparian associations. Or food plant. If you're going to hang around the food plant it's a good idea too because I mean, you know, your whole biology can be situated around the food plant. So the whole deal with, with, uh, with uh, you know, finding the mate then becomes a matter of identifying the mate. So you have the courtship. Now the ways that the courtship takes place is, you know, depending on what kind of a butterfly. Are you a patrolling butterfly that's kind of cruising around, see a female and you go chase her? Or are you sitting there you know, like a rocket launcher waiting for... And they, they do both. They do both. And I, I, I've just described them with my four drawings here, but they do both. They sit. Uh, skippers, for instance, are notorious for sitting in a kind of a launch pad, you know, waiting for something to come by, and boom, they're out looking at it. And they'll identify whether it's a, uh, a, male, a male drone species or a, another a, a small tail or a female drone species, and they have a, a reaction to each of those things. So all I'm trying to do is identify. So how do they identify? They have these sex patches, okay? See these dark patches on the wings on the top one there? See the, oh gosh, I need to point it out of school when I point at it. These, these thing here, I broke it. These uh, black uh, scales along the uh, the radial wings of the forewing, and then you can see all these other little patches that contain scales, which uh, basically act as releases uh, for the female. It's like if the female is being suited, she makes the decision. And if you don't have the right smell, uh, the right chemical stimulus, then you get rejected. It's very important that females make the right choice. And everyone should tell their daughters that. <laughs> now, there's more and more of the same. And these things aren't just on the wing. Some of these can have uh, ancillary devices uh, associated with the, the, uh, the genitalia that put out, uh, um, you know, very, very uh, prominent uh, smells that can be identified. And I'm going to go through this. A case in point, this is a uh, juba skipper. It's got the stigma in the male in the upper right, and the female has you know, some scaling where the skipper would be, but... Did you make that up, stink? No, that's that's the that's, that's one of the same club, yeah. Uh, monarch, same thing, male on the upper side's got the uh, the heliconial uh, patch on the hind wing where's the female lacks it. Uh, this if you look closely, it's kinda of hard to see maybe, but right below the, the, the discal cell on the forewing there's an uh, angular streak of, of like grayish brown scales. You guys see that? Yep. It's a male in the male and the female lacks it. <laughs> same thing, it's more obvious here in the Crixus uh, uh, Arctic. Okay, now we get to those, those habitats we were talking about. Habitats that are riparian, they're linear. Now it's really cool on a butterfly that occurs in the city. The riparian and corridor in a city is often reduced into like streets, okay, and they're uh, in parks, margins of trees. And what's really cool, butterflies in the, in the normal 
environments in eastern Washington, like the, uh, the tiger swallowtails and the pale tigers, cruise up and down these uh, creek beds. Um, you know, situations like this, they're up and down there. Well, in, in, in the city, of course, that there's, the creeks are, are gone, so all we have is streets. And you'll notice, if you sit in a, uh, in a place where there's, they're common in the summer in the city, you'll see them cruising up and down the streets, just like they're a riparian quarter. So they, they, they do take advantage. Now, you don't see them going uphill, you know. In the woods, you don't see them going uphill. They're staying pretty much in these riparian habitats. And, and conversely, as you move up a hillside from a riparian situation, you can see that the, most of the butterflies that you're going to encounter are going to be on hilltops or in the bottom. You don't get a lot of them that are strictly hillside species. There are exceptions, of course. And there's exceptions to everything. Uh, there's exceptions uh, for butterflies whose food plants are on these hillsides, and in fact, they're food plant associated. So they kind of fall into the class of those food plant associated. And this is a good example of what a riparian, a contrasting habitat. I was talking about contrast. Okay, the hilltops and the and the riparian associations are contrasting sites. And they allow the you know males and, and, and females to find each other because the males will choose one or the other. It's very interesting. We have two green hair streaks that are exactly opposite in that strategy, and yet it's so similar in every other aspect of their biology. The, the uh, Sheridan's green hair streak is down in the riparian areas, and uh, and the, uh, the immaculate green hair streaks up on the hilltops in the same basic vicinity, exploiting entirely different mate location mm -hmm. devices. There's probably a good reason for that. That's another riparian community. You get on the ridge tops, and it's pretty obvious that ridge tops tend to be very, very stark uh, contrast to the adjacent environment. You can see that you know it's kind of precipitous, and any animal that is, is choosing to assemble in these kinds of habitats are really going to concentrate and make themselves available and obvious to the female. So if a female needs to get mated, he just, he, she just goes to the, the tab on the top of the ridge, you know, gets mated, and then wherever she goes after that, it's not important because the males have served their function as useless bags of gamut. And then this, oh, that's not as focused as it seemed to be. This is an example of a food plant dispersal, okay? Now, if butterflies here would be associated with these food plants. And how many times have you been on field trips where we go and we see a buckwheat? And, oh, there's the butterflies. And then, you know, we go to the next, but oh, they're there, they're there. You don't see them any, anywhere in between. They might be in the mud or something like that, but basically that's, that's what this all is. So get back to that, get back to that swallowtail coming down that hillside. You know, I was puzzled for a long time about why he was having such a good time. And then I figured out he wasn't violating any of the biologic imperatives. He was actually right on. One of the things that happens when he said that, you know, survival is its own reward, what is reproductive reproduction's own reward? And, and I thought to myself, geez, it's going to be hard to tell a group of people, but hey, it's fun. And that rubs off. If something it feels good, the genetic component that puts that into your system ends up showing up. So like, it's really a, a butterfly is predisposed to feeling good when, when things are good. It's feeling good. That butterfly was feeling good. And it was entirely within the realm of its genetic constitution. Because you see how excited they get when, they, when they're having fun. It, it seems like that, you know, just the fact that there's that pathway means that that pathway can manifest itself in the other behavior, which is, once again, surviving, staying alive. So y'all do that. If you keep doing that, you can be a butterfly too. <laughs>